Hello and welcome to a live after reading. I'm Tim Niederreiter, and I'm alone again tonight, but not for long, because this is going to be a brief podcast, and I'm happy to wish you all a good new year, happy holidays, all that stuff, because it's the end of 2020, and I wanted to look back at some things that happened this year, and I wanted to talk about some stuff, but to be honest, my year wasn't all that remarkable, and a lot of us had a tough time. With the pandemic, with all these things right now, my my pandemic Christmas is kind of still going on, and I will be going back to join them, well, or going to sleep soon. But I wanted to talk to all of you because I owe you a podcast for the end of the year, and I think I don't I don't want to miss I don't I don't want to miss a drop, you know I don't want to miss an episode. I don't want you to miss having me around for a weekend. And so here I am, but I, I I thought of a good a good little reading to mark this occasion. And this is again, it's nonfiction, but it's quite memorable. I love this little excerpt, this story. It's actually a war story from 1945. Uh, it's called "The Battle of the Bulge" by Martha Gellhorn, and it is about the Battle of the Bulge in World War II, which is the the great offensive the German military, the Nazi military waged against the Western Front and tried to push push the United States and the other allies back to the sea. And though there's this is not the most important even battle of World War II by any means. It's very it's important, but it's not the most important because actually I if you ask me, some of the most vital conflicts were taking place on the Eastern Front as well as you know, as all over the world, obviously there was fighting everywhere and all bloody and horrific as war is. But this account of the Battle of the Bulge is mighty. It's also quite brief. So I think you'll bear with me here as I read from to you from The Battle of the Bulge by Martha Gellhorn. January 1945. They all said it was great, it was wonderful, kraut killing country. What it looked like was scenery for a Christmas card. Smooth white snow hills and bands of dark forest and villages that actually nestled. The snow made everything serene from a distance. At sunrise and sunset, the snow was pink and the forests grew smoky and soft. During the day, the sky was covered with ski tracks, that was covered with ski tracks, the vapor trails of plains, and the roads were dangerous ice strips. Crowded with all the usual vehicles of war, and the artillery made a great deal of noise as did the bombs from the thunderbolts. The nestling villages, upon closer view, were mainly rubble, and there were indeed plenty of dead krauts. This was during the German counteroffensive, which drove through Luxembourg and Belgium, and is now driven back. At this time, the Germans were being contained, as the communique said. And the situation was fluid. Again, the communique. For the sake of record, here is a little of what containing a fluid situation in kraut-killing country looks like. The road to Bastogne had been worked over by the 9th Air Force for Thunderbolts before the 3rd Army tanks finally cleared the way. A narrow alley was free now, and two or three secondary roads leading from Bastogne back to our lines. Lines is a more inaccurate word, a most inaccurate word, and one should really say leading back through where the Germans weren't to where the Americans were scattered about the snowscape. The Germans remained on both sides of this alley, and from time to time attempted to push inward and again and again cut off Bastogne. A colleague and I drove up to Bastogne on a man de- on a secondary road through breathtaking scenery. The Thunderbolts had created the scenery. You can say the words death and destruction, and they don't mean anything. But they are awful words when you are looking at what they mean. There were some German staff cars along the side of the road. They had not merely been hit by machine gun bullets. They had been mashed into the ground. There were half-tracks and tanks literally wrenched apart. And in a gun position, directly hit by the bomb, by bombs, all around these lacerated or flattened objects of steel, there was the usual riffraff: papers, tin cans, cartridge belts, helmets, an odd shoe, clothing. There were also ignored and incompletely inhuman 
hard frozen corpses of Germans. Then there was the clump of houses burned and gutted with only a few small a few walls standing, and around them the enormous bloated bodies of cattle. The road passed through a curtain of pine forest and came out on a flat, st- rolling, snowy field. In this field, the sprawl, their bunched bodies of Germans lay thick, like some dark, shapeless vegetable. We had watched the thunderbolts working for several days. They flew in small packs and streaked in to attack on in single file. They passed quickly through the skies, and when they dived, you held your breath and waited. It seemed impossible that the planes would be able to pull, up, pull itself up safely. They were diving to within 60 feet of the ground. The snub-nosed thunderbolt is, the most, is more feared by the German troops than any other plane. You've seen, you've seen Bastogne and a thousand other Bastogne's in the newsreels. These dead towns and villages spread over Europe and one forgets the human misery and, disp- and fear and despair that the cracked and caved-in buildings represent. Bastogne was a German job of death and destruction, and it was beautifully thorough. The 101st Airborne Division, which held Bastogne, was still there, though the day before the wounded had been taken out as soon as the first road was open. The survivors of the 101st Airborne Division, after being entirely surrounded, uninterruptedly shelled and bombed, after having fought off four times their strength in Germans, look, for some reason unknown, some unknown reason, cheerful and lively. A young lieutenant remarked, the tactical situation was always good. He was very surprised when he shouted with laughter. The front north of Bastogne was just up the road, and the peril was far from past. At Warnock, on the other side of the main Bastogne Road, some soldiers who had taken lost and retaken this miserable village were not not sightseeing the battlefield. They were also inspecting the blown-out equipment of two German tanks and the German self-propelled gun which had been destroyed there. Warnock smelled of the dead. In sub-zero weather, the smell of death has an acrid, burning odor. The soldiers poked through the German equipment to see if there was anything useful or desirable. They unearthed a pair of good bedroom slippers alongside the tank, but as no one in the infantry has any chance to wear bedroom slippers, these were left. There was a German Bible, but no one could read German. Someone had found a German machine pistol in working order and rapidly salted it away. They hoped to find another. They find hoped to find other equally valuable loot. The American dead had been moved inside the smashed houses and covered over. The dead horses and cows lay where they were, as did a few dead Germans. An old civilian was hopelessly shoveling grain from the, some bird and burst sack into a wheelbarrow. And further down the road, a street, the ruined street, a woman was talking French in a high, angry voice with the, to the chaplain, who was trying to pacify her. We moved down this way to, to watch the goings-on. Her house was in fairly good shape. That is to say, it had no windows or doors, and there was a shell in a hole through the second-floor wall. But it was standing, and the roof looked rainproof. Outside her parlor window, parlor window, there were some German mines marked with white tape. She stood in her front hall and said bitterly that it was a terrible thing. She had left her house for a few moments that morning. Upon returning, she found her sheets had been stolen. What are, what's she saying? asked the enormous soldier with red-rimmed blue eyes and a stubble of red beard. Everyone seems about the same age, as if weariness and strain and unceasing cold leveled all, all life. I translated the woman's complaint. Another soldier said, What does a sheet look like? The huge red bearded man drawled out, My goodness, a delicious expression coming from a face on the st- from that face in the st- that street. If she'd been there when the fighting was going on, she'd act differently. Further down the street, a command car dragged a trailer. The bodies of Germans were piled on the trailer like so much ghastly firewood. We had come up this main road. Main, we had come up the ma- this main road. Excuse me here. And two days before. First, there had been a quick, tempestuous scene in a battalion headquarters when two planes strafed us, roaring into attack three times and putting machine gun bolts neatly through the second-story windows of the house. The official attitude had always been that no Germans were flying reclaimed thunderbolts, so that is but that. No one was wounded or killed during this brief muck-up. One of the battalion machine gunners who had been firing at the thunderbolts said, For God's sake, which side are those guys fighting on? We jumped into our jeep and drove the up near the front, feeling that the front was probably safer. A solitary tank was parked close to the bombed-out house near the main road. The crew sat on top of the tank, watching a village just over the hill which was being shelled, as well as the bombed by the thunderbolts. The village was burning, and the smoke made a close package of fog around it, but the flames shot up and reddened the snow in the foreground. The armed forces on this piece of front consisted at the moment of this tank 
and out ahead a few more tanks, and somewhere invisible to the left of a squadron, a squadron of tanks. We did not know where our infantry was. This was, is what a fluid situation means. The attacked village would soon be entered by the tanks, including the solitary watchdog now guarding this road. We inquired of the tank crew how everything went. The war is over, said one of the soldiers sitting on the turret. Don't you know that? I heard it on the radio a week ago. The Germans haven't any gasoline. They haven't any planes. Their tanks are no good. They haven't any shells for their guns. Hell, it's all over. I asked myself what I'm doing here, the tankist went on. I say to myself, boy, you're crazy sitting out here in the snow. There ain't Germans. Those ain't Germans. I say to myself, didn't they tell you on the radio the Germans are finished? As for the situation, someone else on the tank said they would gratefully appreciate it if we could tell them what was going on. The woods full of dead krauts and another pointed across the road. We came up here and sprayed it just in case and there was a, there was any around and it seems like the place was full of them. So it's good to know we sprayed it all right. But where they are at right now, I wouldn't know. How's your hen? asked the captain who had come from battalion HQ to show us the way. He's got a hen, the captain explained. He's been sweating that hen for three days, running around after it without a helmet. My hen's worthless, said the soldier. Finished. No good. Got no fighting her. Just like the Germans, said the one who listened to the radio. Now two days later, the road was opened much further, and there was even a rumor that it was open all the way to Bastogne. That would mean avoiding the secondary roads a quicker journey, but it seemed a good idea to inquire at a blasted German gun position. At this point... There were ten Americans, two sergeants and eight enlisted men, also two smashed Jordan bodies, two dead cows, and a gutted house. I wouldn't go up that road if I was you, one of the sergeants said. It's cut through with small arms fire without a quarter of a mile further on. About a quarter of a mile further on. We took st- took about 17 Heinies out of there just a while back, but some others must have got in. That seemed to settle the road. Anyhow, the sergeant went on. They're making a counterattack. They got about 30 tanks. We heard coming this way. The situation was getting very fluid again. What are you going to do, I said. Stay here, said one of the soldiers. We got a gun, said, the, said another. War is lonely and individual work. It is hard to realize how small it can get. Finally, it can boil down to a ten unshaven, gaunt-looking young man from anywhere in America, stationed on a vital road with, a German, with German tanks coming in. You better take that side road if you're going to Bastogne, the, sergeant, the second sergeant said. It seems shameful to leave them. Good luck, I said, not knowing what to say. Sure, sure, they said soothingly, and later on they got a tank and the road was never cut up. They got a tank and the road was never cut, and now if they're still alive, they're somewhere in Germany doing the same work, as undramatically and casually. Just any ten young young men from anywhere in America. About a mile from this place, and therefore about a mile and a half from the upcoming oncoming German tanks, the general in the in command of the tank outfit at his headquarters in a farmhouse. You could not easily enter his office through the front door because there, a dead horse with spattered entrails blocked the way. A shell had landed in the farmhouse, in the farmyard a few min- minutes before and killed one cow and wounded a second, which makes, which was making bad sounds, sad sounds in a passageway between the, ho- the house and the barn. The air ground support officer was here in, a, in his van, checking up in the Thunderbolts who were attacking the oncoming German tanks. Argue leader... He said, calling on the radio phone to the fight leader, Beagle here. Did you get any good? Any do you do any good on that one? Can't say yet. Answered the voice from the air. Then, over the loudspeaker, a new voice came from the air, taking, talking clearly and loudly and calmly. Three tigers down, and there and there with people around them. Also from the air, the voice of argue leader replied rather peevishly, "Go in and get them. Don't stand there talking about it." They were both moving at an approximate speed of 300 miles an hour. From the radio in another van came the voice of the colonel commanding the forward tank unit, which was stopped in this counterattack on the ground. We got just we got 10 and 2 more incoming, said the colonel's voice. Just wanted to keep you posted on the German tanks burning up here. It's a beautiful sight. A beautiful, beautiful sight. Over. What a lovely headquarters, said a soldier who was making himself a toasted cheese sandwich over a small fire that served everyone for warmth and cook, as a cook stove. He had opened the cheese can in his K-ration and was doing an excellent job using a German bayonet as a kitchen utensil. Furthermore, said a lieutenant, they're attacking on the other side. They got about 30 tanks coming in from the west, too. See if I care, remarked the soldier, turning his bread carefully so as to toast it in both ways. A shell landed, but it was further up the road. There had been a fa- vaguely sketched general ducking a quick reflex a- action, but no... 
one of course remarked it. The argue leader then argue leader's voice came exultantly from the air. Got those three. Going home now. Over. Good boy, said the ground officer. Best there is, my squadron. Listen to him, said the artillery officer would come over to report. You think the Thunderbolts did everything? Well I gotta get back to work. The cow went on moaning softly in the passageway. Our driver, who, has made no, who had made no previous comment during the day, said bitterly, What I hate to see is a bunch of livestock all beat up this way. God damn it, what have they got to do with it? It's not their fault. Christmas had passed almost unnoticed, and those who could, and they, that would mean no further, and all, the, and all those who could, and that would mean no further back forward than the battalion headquarters had shaved and eaten turkey. The others did not shave and ate cold K rations. That was Christmas. There was a little celebration on New Year's Eve because everyone was occupied and there was nothing to drink. Now on New Year's Day, we were getting up to visit the front east of Luxembourg City. The front was quiet in the early afternoon, except for artillery and a beautiful fat flaked snowstorm had started. We decided, like millions of other people, that we were both heartily sick of war. What we really wanted to do was borrow a sled and go coasting. We borrowed a homemade wooden sled from an obliging little boy and found a steep, slick hill near an abandoned stone quarry. It was then evidently a well-known hill because a dozen Luxembourg children were already there with unsteerable sleds like ours. The sky had cleared and the ever-present thunderbolts returned and were working over in the front less than four kilometers away. They made a lot of noise and the artillery was pounding away too. The children paid no attention to this. They did not watch the thunder, thunderbolts or pay, listen to the artillery. Screaming with joy, fear, and good spirits, they continued to slide down the hill. Our soldier driver stood with me at the top of the hill and watched the children. Children aren't so dumb, he said. I got nothing. I said nothing. Children are pretty smart, he said. I said nothing again. What I mean is, children got the right idea. What people ought to do is go coasting. When he dropped us that night, he said, I sure got to thank you, folks. I haven't had so much fun since I left home. On the night of New Year's Day, I thought of a wonderful New Year's resolution for the men who run the world. Get to know the people who only live in it. There were many dead and many wounded, but the survivors contained the fluid situation and slowly turned it down into a retreat. And finally, as the communique said, the bulge was ironed out. This was not done fast or easily, and it was not done by those anonymous things, armies, divisions, regiments. It was done by men, one by one. Your man. Martha Gellhorn, 1945. So, okay. That's the reading. And I'm pleased to say it's been a little longer than I expected. It, it, I, I love that passage. I love that reading. Martha Gellhorn was a hell of a writer. Doesn't get enough credit, probably, thanks to being a little bit in Ernest Hemingway's shadow as well. Um, I think she was married to Hemingway for a while there. Yeah. They definitely had something going on. But, yeah... It is a fascinating and telling tale because we may not have a great big world war going on right now, but we have our own problems. We have a pandemic. And who's going to solve this problem? We are, one at a time, one by one. That's how I see it anyway. Yes, we can ha- we're can. we going to need those vaccines, but people have to use them. We're going to have to do all the things we have to do to survive. And that doesn't change. That's the same as it's ever been. Anyway, I don't mean to preach. Thanks for listening, everybody. You can find more about this podcast at mentalcellarpublications.com. Happy New Year. And stay safe, everybody. Thanks for listening. That tears it.